Hello, everyone, and welcome to Post Podium, the podcast where former Jeopardy contestants are instead giving questions and asked to provide answers. I'm your host, Jarek Bruel, and joining me today is Zach Goslin, who was on last episode to help break down the Second Chance Tournament roster, and Bliss, a fan of the show who actively maintains a comprehensive Google Sheet titled The All-Time Jeopardy Leaderboard from 1984 to the Present. Both of you, welcome to the show. Hi, Jarek. Thanks for having me on. Hey, uh, happy to accidentally become this podcast tournament correspondent. <laughs> of course. Um, now, before we get into the thick of things, I want our listeners to get to know you a little more, Bliss. First, what made you decide one day to start a project as grand as the Jeopardy leaderboard? I'm sure you had to comb through a ton of data at first, but after that, I suppose it became a matter of updating it whenever new records or tournaments took place. What was your main motivation? So full disclosure, I've been a longtime fan since I was like seven years old. Um, I actually started watching the episode before Ken first appeared. And it was by total accident. I'm pretty sure I was at like my grandma's house or something. So for many years, I had kind of like lurked through the Sony Pictures forums before it was Jboard. There have actually been like a lot of people who have attempted to do leaderboards like this. And a lot of my data is um, kind of derived from, if you remember him, he is 2003 college champion Keith Williams. Yes, I've met him before. And, um, oh, he was the, the, the final wager guy, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah final wager. Uh, and he used to have a leaderboard, but I think around 2019 is when he stopped updating. And then I had kind of remembered that um, because these leaderboards goes bar- go back as far as like the 90s. I remember there was like a Google Groups post from <laughs> 1996. Just ever since then, uh, it's been getting these updates as the show's gotten more iconic over the years. And so I just kind of realized that nobody was really doing it anymore after the All-Star Games where Brad and uh, Larissa and David all won. And so I did my own research and uh, compiled info based on what I could find on the J-Archive as well as the Final Wagers leaderboard. From there on, I just uh, started to do it by like Reddit posts and then I started to do it through Google Sheets last year. I think I started at a good time. Oh, yeah, for sure. With season 38 and the amount of records being set, definitely. So is all of the data entry done manually? Do you have a background in computer science or is something or something related that makes scraping large amounts of data easier for you? I kind of learned manually how to use Google Sheets through some college courses I took because I was going to school for web development and computer science for a little bit, but... I had already started working on this leaderboard a f- like a couple years before that. I believe um, like Jason Zaffranieri's run is when it started to like get more popular. And then I finally made a Google Sheets, which has gone through some updates, whether it just be adding borders or like changing the color. I even like added these extra sections that show the results of every single tournament including the seniors tournament from like ages ago and uh teachers tournaments, teen tournaments, you know, there's a lot of them. And there's now a new one for second chance tournament. And I already have all the players put in for that. And I tend to like assign certain colors to players who are playing in week one and who are playing in week two, just to make it kind of easier. So you take your statistics from the one and only J archive, and you also mention Reddit, Jboard, and the Sony, the old Sony forums as other places where you get your data from. I noticed there are a lot of footnotes about certain games and people. So I'd also be interested to know where you get that sort of knowledge as well. Oh yeah. You know, funny thing about that footnotes section, I actually have not updated that since 2020. Um, so it's, it's kind of dated in a lot of ways and like, Frankly, it's pretty ugly looking, especially in light mode. Regardless, uh, when it comes to those footnotes, do you have any uh, ones in particular that you are curious about in the footnotes section? Yeah, actually, when I was reading it before we started recording today, oops, there goes my phone. There was, I believe there was one about someone who committed a felony and didn't get invited to the TOC. Oh, yeah. Uh, uh, this one. Jerry Slowick was a... Uh, 
good champion was uh often thought of as like a favorite to win that tournament but uh yeah he uh got busted doing something that I, like honestly if you really want to know i would just look it up because it's, <laughs> it's kind of tough to talk about interesting um, okay it's it's a pretty bad crime oh but boy <laughs> Oh. Just know it was bad enough to like completely disinvite him from the tournament. There's another little footnote. Um, do either of you know the name Jeff Kirby? It rings a bell, but I don't know specifics. Oh, I know Jeff Kirby. I'm I'm checking because I think it, he wouldn't necessarily appear because I think he lost both of his games, which kind of gives away what happened with him. He was a man who appeared on Jeopardy in 1999 and did fine didn't win, came in third, and then ele- uh, 10 years later, applied again. Oh, again. I remember this story. Told him, yeah, remember never story. told them he was uh, <laughs> yeah. already already on. So he had, in terms of prize money, would have earned, I guess because you're thrown in a 1999 prize, like a, a thousand bucks and a camera, <laughs> but <laughs> never got the thousand. Like they, they figured out that he duplicated his, his appearance sometime before the prize money went out. So they, yeah. they had a whole statement that was like, no, he doesn't get it. So I remember this story now because it was a post on, I think, r slash today I learned. And that's how I learned that, yeah, he appeared twice. And um, outside of, like, invites to tournaments and whatnot, I think he's the only person to get away with that. I'm adding r today I learned to, like, my list of things to, like, study things. It's a good about. sub. Highly recommend. I don't mean to put you on the spot, but is there one Jeopardy stat in particular that you can pull out which may surprise some people listening? Yes. Okay. So, Matea Roach, right? Amazing champion. We all love her. Do you know how long the record for the most money won for a Canadian champion was before her? Over 30 years. Oh my lord. Yeah. Bob Blake was uh, the 1990 Tournament of Champions winner. And that's back when the show was pre-doubled amounts and also when the TOC top prize was 100000 He won five games and $82,501, which would be 165000 nowadays. There's also the $10,000 from Super Jeopardy and from Ultimate Tournament of Champions, where he was eliminated in round one. But yeah, so he's ranked number 55 currently. His total of all time is 197,501. And it took Matea nine games to surpass that. Wow. That's... So there you go. (laughs) That's that's crazy. No wonder she became a national icon in her home country <laughs> with, the oh, amount of pu- with the amount of publicity she got. Well, it's certainly a pleasure to have you on the podcast, Bliss, and thank you for the work you do to maintain the leaderboard. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. Uh, we'll likely bring this up again at the end of the episode, but where can people find the Almighty Leaderboard? How can they access the Google Sheet? So I think the most prominent link, um, I have it in my Jboard bio too. My username on there is Finish M Zoe. E-M-Z-O-E. It's, it's a play on a, a Denzel Curry song. There's a uh, sidebar link on the subreddit as well. Uh, it should just say exactly what it's uh, been called this whole time, too. The all-time Jeopardy leaderboard. I think it has my old username, though, which is kind of annoying. Right now, it's Hell's Hospitals, just because it sounds cool. Back then, it was Generation N Hatred. So, I don't know. I'm undecided. <laughs> All good. So yeah, you guys can find the all-time Jeopardy leaderboard on the sidebar of the Jeopardy subreddit. It's somewhere along there. So yeah, you can go check that out if you're interested. Thank you again, Bliss. Now let's get into the main topic of this episode, and that is this year's Tournament of Champions. The complete roster and tournament format were revealed in the third episode of Inside Jeopardy uh, with special guest 2017 TOC winner and style icon Buzzy Cohen and it was full of pleasant surprises. This year's Tournament of Champions will feature 21 competitors rather than the usual 15. The roster is composed of the winner of the inaugural Jeopardy Professors Tournament, the winner of the Winter 2022 Jeopardy National College Championship, the winners of Week 1 and 2 of the inaugural Jeopardy Second Chance Tournament, and the 17 contestants with the greatest number of wins between January 2021 and July 2022. The competition will be divided into three rounds of play, the quarterfinals, semifinals, and finals. Because of their stellar performances during during their initial appearances, Matt Amodio, Amy Schneider, and Matea Roach 
have first round buys and are automatically seeded into the semifinals. The remaining 18 competitors will be divided into six quarterfinal matches, and the winners will advance and join Matt, Amy, or Matea in the semifinals. Take note now that there are no wildcard positions for quarterfinal non winners. The winners of the three semifinal matches will advance to the finals, which will be played using the 2019 Jeopardy Goat tournament format. The first person to win three games of Jeopardy out of a maximum of seven will be crowned the 2022 TOC winner. The 2022 TOC will air immediately after the second chance tournament starting Monday, October 31st, and will end sometime between November 15th and 21st. So some fun facts about this format. This guarantees us fans at least 12 games and a maximum of 16. The quickest way to win the TOC is if you're Amy, Matt, or Matea, and win four games, a semifinal win and a 3-0-0 sweep, which if you ask me would low-key make for an underwhelming tournament run. Let's be real here. Uh, the longest and most dramatic way to win the TOC is if you're one of the winners of the second chance tournament where you win your first game, the two game total point affair, win your quarterfinal and semifinal matches and win the finals 3-2-2. That's 12 games of Jeopardy over the course of four to five taping days. The SCT will supposedly be filmed on September 14th and 15th, while the TOC will tape somewhere between September 19th and 22nd. We've had a couple of days to ponder this news, and I think this was the best case scenario. Uh, Matt, Amy, and Matea are well deserving of their first round buys, and restructuring the finals to mimic the GOAT tournament is a way better test of mental capacity and stamina than the traditional two-game total point affair. I think it also takes out some of the randomness associated with playing two games only, as well as the possibility of having a lock tournament by the by the time game two finishes, similar to what happened in the finals of the JNCC. My hope is that once the finals arrives at tournament point, where one player has two wins under their belt and their their third winning game doesn't finish a finish in a lock, and final jeopardy isn't a foregone conclusion. So Zach and Bliss, what do you think of this formalized roster and format? On the format front, I think, again, like Michael Davies being someone who thinks about Jeopardy as a sport, it kind of pulls from two different traditions of postseason. When you see postseasons in sports, they're kind of on the spectrum of like the ones that are very, very rigid in terms of always producing, you know, always rewarding the best and most skilled competitors versus the ones that are very random. So the examples are like the Premier League, which is a round robin. There's no postseason. It's very fair but also very hard to swing upsets very hard for a team to get hot through the whole season and and win the league that way march madness is the other example where it's a big single elimination tournament so with this structure you kind of have half of one and half of the other where no, with there being no wild cards and one game single elimination in the first two rounds really opens the door for a really unpredictable final round it makes it very hard for me to look at the field and go, okay, well, obviously, you know, Matt, Matea, Amy are obviously going to be the three in the finals. Whereas once we get to that final, it's going to be really hard for someone to chance their way or fluke their way or get hot for that long of a span and, and win the tournament that way. So that's kind of my first impression where on the one hand, it makes the, the final very unpredictable or makes it makes who's in the final very unpredictable. But then that final is going to be, it's probably going to reward the most skilled Jeopardy player out of the three. Bliss, how about you? I think it's good overall. I was a little bit unsure about the buys at first, just because I remember the ultimate tournament of champions pretty well. There were like nine buys for round two, I believe. But there's just a lot of ways in which I feel like the higher seeded player is actually disadvantaged because it just kind of seems to set them up for failure, which I'm a little bit afraid of for uh, Amy, Matt, and Matea, especially as I look at this field expanded now. Yeah, overall, I think it's good in the prospect that it gives more players a chance like Margaret, Christine, and Maureen. Uh, an arc that I was a big fan of, personally. I thought that all three were very likable. All three were very good at the game. And they were all charming in their own unique ways. I mean, Christine had a really cool story. And she's obviously overcome a lot of adversity already. And then Margaret, honestly, I feel like she was a lot better than like what a four-day total 
of about 80,000 would suggest in a field like this. Because if she had been right on that final against Maureen, then she'd have a, over $100,000. And I have a feeling she'd do pretty good the next few games as well. It's, it's really tough to predict. And I think that's kind of charming. But it also kind of leaves me wondering, which gets me a lot of adrenaline. <laughs> yeah, I mean, briefly on the point of the, the expanded tournament, I think just because it was such a season of streaks and even going back to like the tail end of season 37, in the same way that like the, the second chance tournament addresses the cosmic joke of studying your whole life for trivia and going up against Amy or Matt or Matea or whoever, these people who very much had very good runs as four game champions and would have made other TOC fields without question because there were so many five plus day automatic qualifiers. Like there was some luck there. There's some bad luck there that you happen to have a very strong streak in the same year that a bunch of other people had slightly stronger ones. So this was the right year to mess with the format. It isn't, it isn't something that's set in stone. I know the 15 person field is very traditional, like recently, but as we start to enter this world of the of the Davo Jeopardy, the Davo enter era of Jeopardy, where we probably are going to see more recurring characters and recurring contestants over longer spans than just like their run and their TOC. This expands the pool of who could be in that sort of world in the, the future honors or masters or what have you. Yeah, I think if you were going to change the format for any TOC or season, this would have been the one to do it just because of, you know, the way it played out. Now, moving on to my tier list and power rankings. Before I get started, let me remind everyone that this is only my opinion, and whatever Zach and Bliss share is also only their opinions. They're completely subjective, which is why they're both here to either agree or disagree with me. Same for me and their opinions. The first thing I did was I chose metrics or categories I wanted to consider as part of my methodology, and in order of priority, they were average Coriat score, percentage of games won in locks, final Jeopardy get rate, buzz percentage, daily double get rate, and correct response rate. For the sake of factoring in Jaskarin and Sam as tournament, champ tournament champions, I decided to take the number of games won out of the equation. And before I forget, credit to both the Jeopardy fan and J Archive for these numbers and stats. The first person in each of these categories would receive 19 points. Second would receive 18 points, third would receive 17 points, and so on. This system assumes that I'm weighing all the categories equally, so to fix this, I came up with an adjusted point total, which assigns percentages to categories I felt were more important than others. Average Coriot score was weighted 60%, percentage of games won in locks was weighted 15%, final Jeopardy get rate was weighted 10%, buzz percentage was rated was weighted excuse me 7% daily double get rate was weighted 5% and correct response rate was weighted 3% after crunching the numbers I took a good look at where everyone stood rankings wise and I was satisfied with how it turned out I divided the competitors into three tiers s a and b and I further divided the a and b tiers into three levels each a plus a a minus, B plus, B, and B minus. Plus and minus symbols only represent a small advantage slash disadvantage among competitors within the same letter tier. Each letter tier represents a skill gap, quote unquote skill gap, between sets of competitors. Players in the same tier are more likely to have competitive games and could win against each other depending on the day. Players in higher tiers are expected to defeat players below them, and an upset occurs when a lower tier player defeats a player of higher ranking. So we'll start with the S tier, competitors who had an adjusted points total above 16.6 .6 out of a maximum of 19, which includes Matt Amodio, 18.1, and Amy Schneider, 17.5. Between the two of them, Matt has the higher average Coriat score, final Jeopardy get rate, buzz percentage, and daily double get rate. Amy has the higher percentage of games won in locks and correct response rate. Now, you may be asking yourself, what about Matea? Shouldn't they be in the S tier, considering they've also been seeded into the semifinals along with Matt and Amy? So this will probably be one of my many hot takes shared in this episode, but... You unfortunately can't convince me that Matea's gameplay is on the same level as Matt or Amy's. In fact, I'd argue she's actually closer to someone like Andrew He, who I think is the fourth best competitor in this TOC. Matea scores higher than Andrew in every category except percentage of games won in locks. And if you compare Matea and Andrew's composite scores, 
Matea at 14.6 is only slightly above Andrew 14.4 because of how I decided to weigh the categories. As a result, I decided to place Matea and Andrew on equal footing on the A plus level where their adjusted points total falls between 14.3 and 16.6. Zach and Bliss, is Matt, Amy, Matea the order you'd rank these players? Do you think Matea belongs in the S tier with Matt and Amy? And do you think it's fair to put Andrew on equal footing with Matea? I mean, for all we know, his streak could have gone beyond five games had he not run into Amy. Plus, he helped Sam Cavanaugh practice for his TOC, which he ended up winning last year. So there are two different questions you're asking here, and I'll answer the first one first. We'll go back to the second one after I, I'll, I'll give Bliss a chance to uh, address this as well. Because the first question I think that everybody has is the Matt versus Amy thing. I agree that they're the top two. It's a pretty obvious top two. Um, to the point where I, I did the same sort of web scraping that I did for the SCT preview. I ordered every individual Jeopardy game by Coriat score. I'd like to read who had the top Coriat performances, like individual games in the sort of TOC, this current TOC era, in order. Matt, 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 Amy, Matt, Matt, Amy, Matt, Matt, Amy, Matt, Amy, Amy, Amy. Matt, 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 Amy, 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 Jonathan Fisher, <laughs> Matt, Matt, Amy, Matt, Amy, Amy, Matt, 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 Amy, Matt, Amy, Matt, Amy, 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 Andrew, Matt, Matt, Matt. That's the top 44 <laughs> in terms of best performances, including winners, including people at multiple games, including everybody in this TOC field. I think it's very fair to put them at the top. I went a bit more holistic, and I would put Amy above Matt. Interesting. Okay. And I will tell you why. It's a play style thing, and that's part of the reason I'd actually... I'm not necessarily rooting for this, but I'd be very interested to see them play each other. Because, if you recall Matt's run, it was this very deliberate strategy of the bottom up, doing the hardest questions, having that money, getting that daily double, controlling the board, keeping opponents off tempo, and just staking out this huge lead and the game's over by the first commercial break. I am somewhat less sure he will be able to pull that off in a tournament of champions versus Amy, who frankly played Jeopardy the way everyone did five years ago, like pre Holtzauer of just going down the board, finding the questions, winning on the buzzer. It was very straightforward. Uh, I have no reason to think it, it won't translate differently in a tournament format. Whereas Matt's whole thing I'm slightly less sure of. And again, to really emphasize this in the way that like the second chance tournament conversation, there's a little bit of an undercurrent with me of like, ah, I could have been in it. All of the people we're talking about today are excellent Jeopardy players. I have no claim to being on any of their levels. Putting that criticism in there, like putting that point amongst this very slight criticism, that's why I would put uh, Amy a little bit ahead of Matt. So basically what you're saying is Amy played good, honest Jeopardy gameplay, and you think that'll take her slightly farther than Matt in the TOC. I'm more in the way that I, I spent a couple of days trying to think of what about Amy's whole thing wouldn't translate to a TOC format, and I couldn't come up with anything, whereas Matt's strategy, there's a world where like he doesn't have that sort of board control against stronger competition and can't do the thing that he did so well for 38, 39 games. Bliss, where would you rank Matt, Amy, and Matea in some sort of order? In terms of Matt, Amy, and Matea exclusively, Matt has the highest winning score average. He has about $40,000 as a win on average, which is really good. That's actually higher than Ken Jennings' average. His is 34000 which is still good. Probably more impressive in the sense that he's a way more traditional player than Matt is. I think that Matt plays more similar similarly to how James plays in terms of like bouncing around the board going for the bigger clues, making big wagers. Amy Schneider has a 34,570 average, which is very in line with how Ken plays and also averages. And then Matea's average is about 24,000. So those numbers do suggest that Matea isn't quite on a level 
that Matt and Amy have pivoted themselves towards. Matea did not have a 30,000 Coriat game. Her highest is 27,000 in her 22nd game. Her second highest being 26,600 for her second game. The only reason that these games were not her biggest wins is because she faced Renee Russell, who we'll see in the second chance tournament, who accumulated 21,000 before Final Jeopardy. And so Matea had no choice but to bet to cover with the minimum cover bet. In those senses, it does kind of look like Matt and Amy are the ones that people are going to look forward to the most. But I think that that will make Matea's semifinal game even more interesting. And I think this is also what made her run so interesting to begin with. If you notice, I have a category for runaway rates. So Matea's runaway rate is 46%, while Amy and Matt are both above 80%. I also have Matea as a level below Amy and Matt, but a level above everybody else. I understand the logic of putting someone like Andrew or Jackie at the same level as Matea, but interestingly enough, there's a site that uh, John Folks, TK Folks, he's actually also in the field setup called Jometry, which is meant to J-Ometry, like J-Archive, which is meant to provide some additional context to the box scores. And let me put it like this. For a long time, there was a conventional wisdom about Jeopardy that it was all about buzzer speed and that, you know, it was just a race to who can buzz in the most because everybody knows everything up there on the stage. The box scores have kind of shown that that's kind of a lie, that usually that the buzzer speed kind of matters, but more so just knowing more matters. But tournament champion structure, buzzer speed really matters because it's actually the case that most people up there know most things. Matea's buzzer speed is ridiculous. Like she's on par, she is measurably on par with Amy. We don't have the numbers for Matt. We don't have the numbers for Andrew, but... To the extent that, like, she's going to be one of the fastest people on the buzzer, regardless of who she's up against, I think is a huge edge in the format. And even though we don't have Andrew's buzzer numbers, which I'm sure would be robust, like, we do have Erica Hasek's numbers, we do have some other some other people who you could maybe make the comp to, and they, just watching the game stylistically, you would think that they would be similarly fast, so that wasn't the case. So if I had Andrew's buzzer numbers... I would consider like putting him at that same level, but just we don't know what we don't know. So I think with, again, the, in the TOC format, I'd put uh, Matea cut above everybody except Andrew, uh, sorry, everybody except Amy and Matt. Sounds logical. Next up, we have the flat A level competitors who had an adjusted points total between 11.9 and 14.3, which for me includes Erica Hasek with 14.0 and Jonathan Fisher with 13.6. So between these two, Eric has a higher average Coriot score, percentage of games won in locks, daily double get rate, and correct response rate, while Jonathan has the higher final Jeopardy get rate and buzz percentage. A lot of people have been choosing Andrew as their dark horse pick for this TOC, and we joked last episode that because of how frequently his name comes up, it doesn't feel like he's the underdog anymore. <laughs> I think a lot of people are underestimating Eric, and I propose he be everyone's new Dark Horse pick. Like Andrew, he ran into another TOC competitor during his run, and I think without running into Megan, we could have seen Eric extend his streak beyond six games. Although Andrew and Eric both benefited from really big daily double wagers during their initial runs, what separates the two by one level is Eric's final Jeopardy get rate. I talked about this with him when he was a guest on the podcast, and it sounded like he just ran into the worst string of categories possible for him in final. Zach and Bliss, do you think Eric and Jonathan are evenly matched? And would you rank Andrew just above Eric when you consider how both of their runs played out and ended? I would put Jonathan... So I put Andrew ahead of both of them, uh, kind of the same tier. But I get, you know, with all the, all the nonsense I just talked about, Andrew, I get it. He's still a very strong competitor. Mm-hmm. My question about Erica Hasek, because I do think you you're right to put Eric and John and J, and, and Jay Fish in the in the same level. Eric's ability to find daily doubles was superhuman, mm-hmm. and I know he's a meteorologist, and I know that's their whole thing is predicting things. But he found two and a half of the three daily doubles 
throughout his games. While having some amount of board control and kind of going back to the comments I made about is Matt going to be able to control the board the way he did um, in regular play in the Tournament of Champions? More so, like, I, I really do question, like, it's a it's honestly an open question. I'm not saying it's not going to happen, but, like, can Eric do that daily double finding and just seek it out in the way that he did during his run? And I think that's a bigger question than... Jonathan, who once again we talked about, had has shown he has a very, very high ceiling as a player, but also was less reliant on that kind of relatively lucky aspect of the game. So I would go, like, if we're ranking the two of them, I'd go, I'd go Jay Fish above Eric, but, and and um, for the millionth time, not to take anything away from Eric, just because, like, I can find more questions about Eric than I can find about Jonathan. Gotcha. How about you, Bliss? Where would you rank uh, those three in conjunction with each other, Andrew, Eric Hasek, and Jay Fish. I do kind of have Andrew, Jonathan, and Eric all in the same tier. Um, I would say Jonathan is slightly ahead of Eric just because he was able to win more games and unseat one of the most hyped players in the tournament already. With Andrew, I would put him probably above Jonathan because his style of play is just perfect for this. And that's also the same reason they put Jackie on the same tier as them. I'll get to Jackie in just a minute when we round out the uh, A tier. But keep in mind that everyone in the A tier, they can pretty much go against each other and have a competitive game still. I mean, like I said, plus and minus is just like a minuscule difference in like skill level, like very minimal. So yeah, I could totally see, you know, Andrew, Eric, Jackie going against each other and perhaps Jackie taking the win over those two. So rounding out the A tier is the A minus level competitors who had an adjusted points total between nine and a half and 11.9, which includes John Folk 11.8, Sam Buttry 11.5, Jaskaran Singh 11.2, and Jackie Kelly 10.1. Of this group, Sam has the highest average Coriot score, daily double get rate, and correct response rate. John has the highest percentage of games won in locks, and Jaskaran has the highest final Jeopardy get rate and buzz percentage. For the record, I will say that John is one of the few people in the TOC whose episodes I did not get to watch. Again, my rankings are just based on numbers and what I perceive to be the important elements in determining a champion's strength. After all, there's a ton of randomness uh, when it comes to Jeopardy, including who you face, the categories you're dealt, and where the daily doubles end up. It was a bit tricky trying to make sense of Sam and Jaskarn's stats just because they won in tournament settings where the clues were tailored specifically for their demographic. Uh, the Professor's Tournament and JNCC placed an emphasis on academia and college adjacent, eh, excuse me, college adjacent trivia. However, all things considered, I think A- is fair to for both of them, as well as John and Jackie, two four-game champions with an average Coria of about 18,100 each. It's also not unheard of for a college champion to make it past the quarterfinals. I think of Terry O'Shea and Drew Gar, who both won their quarterfinal matches and advanced to the semifinals of their TOCs in 2014 and 2019, respectively. Looking at the remainder of the roster that's below John, Sam, Jaskarn, and Jackie, I'd expect these four to win against anyone in the B tier. Zach and Bliss, would you have placed these four as high as I did? And also, if either of you watched John's run when it aired last year, I'd love to hear some of the insight to either justify him being an A-minus competitor or perhaps why he should be ranked lower. Amongst that group of four, I am the most bullish on Jaskarin. I'm the most bullish on him uh, for similar reasons as I discussed with Matea. When we talk about buzzer speed, his was very high as well. And in a tournament champion situation, if it does turn out, we just don't have the numbers for this yet, but if it does turn out that speed matters more in tournament settings like this, and especially at high level tournament settings like this, he almost feels like the value pick if, if you feel like picking Matea is too obvious for that reason. He has a very similar case. Also played very aggressively. Also just stylistically in the same way we talk about Andrew. Feels like he will fit right alongside um, the top tier of competitors. For the record, on the difficulty question, I, I also watched the college tournament. I thought those questions were about par with regular Jeopardy, so I don't think he's got much of a disadvantage there. Ditto Sam Buttry. I am less hot on Sam Buttry. The teacher's tournament was decent quality. The professor's tournament, I'm sorry, was a decent quality tournament, but the gameplay didn't stand out in any particular way. So I do not have him at that same sort of highish level or I wouldn't put him as high. John, John Fox, unfortunately, I also did not see his run. His numbers are very strong and I'm aping them. His literally the numbers he has put out on the internet that I'm using now for this podcast are very strong. <laughs> But I can't really comment on his ability. I will say him, Courtney, Brian, and Zach Newkirk 
all have the preparation time edge because you know especially zach newkirk who we'll get to but like you know john folks episodes wrapped up at the first quarter of 2021 and maybe he wasn't as a four game champion wasn't 100 percent sure he was going to the tournament but there's an edge there in terms of time jackie we've addressed a few times already very aggressive player kind of boom bust i wouldn't be surprised if she like as i mentioned about the structure of the tournament I wouldn't be surprised if she made the finals because she can win two games against anybody. And this is true of basically everybody now. Kind of For me, it's everybody past Jonathan, I think. Everybody out of that top six that we addressed has this situation where, like, because of how unforgiving the structure of the final is going to be, it'll, it'll be tough to see her win, you know, any of these people win three games if there's an Amy or a Matt or a Matea standing next to them because that's just a very difficult thing to ask for yeah so that's that set um bliss do you have anything uh yeah i feel like i did mention some of this a little bit um i do agree with zach in that i don't feel like the professor's tournament was really like the most competitive fields possible there were a lot of low wagers and uh below standard difficulty of like a regular game like, honestly, I feel like in some ways the NCC was like a little bit tougher. Honestly, I, I don't know. Like, it's it's hard to say for sure about Sam because you only have four games to analyze. Mm-hmm. But I will say he was definitely the best in his field. And I do remember him being pretty quick. Now, I did watch John's original run and I put him in the B tier, which is what I consider the true Dark Horse tier. Because I think that John has like like zach mentioned earlier preparation time edge which is the same reason why i put brian and zach in the a tier jaskar and also in the a tier i also think that hyler might be getting a little overlooked too what i found interesting about his run is that in all six of his games he was leading before final jeopardy even his losing game didn't really suggest that his gameplay was slowing down he just didn't know final and uh, with the amount of time that he spends around the trivia community, I, I think I think uh, I think he'll he'll do good things. All right. Next, we have the B tier, and starting at the top, we have the B plus level competitors who had an adjusted points total between seven point one and nine point five, which includes Brian Chang eight point seven, Tyler Rhodes seven point eight, and <gasps> what's this? Ryan Long, 7.7. The disrespect. (laughs) Don't worry, I'll explain myself in just a few moments. Of these three, Brian has the highest average Coriat score. Ryan has the highest percentage of games won in locks and buzz percentage. And Tyler has the highest final Jeopardy get rate, daily double get rate, and correct response rate. Okay, so the reason why Ryan is ranked so low for me is because compared to the rest of the field, he actually scores low in average Coriat score, about 16,800. Final Jeopardy get rate, daily double get rate, and correct response rate. In fact, Ryan ranks 18th in Final Jeopardy get rate at 47%, or 8 out of the 17 finals he participated in. Considering average Coriat score and Final Jeopardy get rate combined make up 70% of his composite score, it's no surprise that he ended up in B-plus territory. I mean, if we take a step back and remember Ryan's run, there were a couple close calls where he'd get Final Jeopardy wrong, but ended up winning because he wagered conservatively and didn't wager to cover second place's doubled score. There were also situations where Ryan could have lost even if he got Final Jeopardy correct for the same reason. We've seen him wager to cover before, but one miscalculation or deviation from that strategy could possibly cost him the game. As for Brian and Tyler, I remember watching some of Brian's run back when it first aired, but it was so long ago that I can hardly remember any of it. I do remember the tiebreaker clue between him and Jack Weller, who will be in the second chance tournament. Tyler's run, I remember watching in the weeks leading up to when I taped for the JNCC, so it's still relatively fresh in my mind. Zach and Bliss, do you agree with where I placed Ryan in my power rankings on par with Brian and Tyler, or do you think I'm severely underrating him by placing him in the B tier? Man, I, with Ryan, I I agree with you in that the numbers don't really tell a story of particular dominance but he won 15 what 15 games 16 games 16 yeah 16 16 games you can't just do that (laughs) people don't just do that i mean hey i took i took wins out of the equation to make things fair for everyone you know sam and and tournaments 
I, I know, but for the most part, it's like a linear, like there's a relationship between these like dominant performances and ability to go on these runs. It's like, I feel like we must be missing something here out of the numbers or something that they just don't tell you. And that's coming from me, Mr. Data. It feels so weird to have a 16 day champion, 16 day champion and not have them be so much higher up the rankings. And I guess it's just that competitive of a field. Yeah. Ryan, Ryan and Tyler both, to, to draw an interesting comparison, I think, there are boards for both of them, because I know Tyler has some specialties that are not super common in like the classics and, and world history sort of space. There are boards that can get them right through to the final, and, and Ryan with the pop culture as well. I don't, again, I don't know wh what that would translate to in a longer tournament start in a longer like seven game series but they both have categories where they will be the best in the field at so there's that tyler as well sort of the opposite of what i was saying about erica hasek averaged less than half a daily double per game so he most of his runs were either without help from daily doubles or just not a lot of help from daily doubles and that i think is significant in that you know it it, it shows it like in terms of dollar figure winnings like probably again like underrates him if you just look at that because he was able to string together these wins mostly on his own merits or mostly on his own knowledge without the luck aspect of it brian chang's run i also remember it less about a particular play style thing more i just like the guy shout out <laughs> my man shout out my man phil gasparetti who ran for mr wolverine as well very likable human being uh play style didn't really ring any special bells for me i think you're right to sort him in the place that you sorted him but i don't have much to add other than that and then what i mentioned about him having quite a while relative to the rest of the field to get ready for this and i'm pretty sure he has been yeah i feel like i'm doing tyler and brian both dirty here by placing them in the b plus tier just because i met both of them and played bar trivia with them so and they were great people so it kind of pains me to put them here it's uh, so yeah here. it's so tough because like yeah all all three of them are very much finals contenders yeah or contenders to make it to the finals i should say and i think it's just strength of the field i would put sam john and jackie below this three group of guys just to make it more okay. explicit. Yeah. Gotcha. But yeah, that's still seven, eight, nine in the order, eight, nine, ten in the order out of a, you know, which it just feels wrong to say that amongst about these this talent. Bliss, what do you think of my decision to place Ryan in the B plus tier? Um spicy. <laughs> <laughs> um but uh honestly, hearing the reasons you gave does kind of give it a little bit more justification. I actually suspected that I was underestimating him by putting him in the A tier below S. But I do think that compared to some of the other long streakers here, his flaws are a little more apparent because his incorrect response rate is a little over three per game, which is more than players like Matt and Amy, who started accumulating a little bit more negs by the end of their runs. What I've noticed about Ryan, though, is that he has a pretty uncanny ability to re to remain incredibly calm under a lot of pressure. Oh, yeah, for sure. Which is which has backed him into a lot of much needed victories, too. And I think that his final Jeopardy wagering is also very strategic in a lot of ways, because I think that he while remaining calm under a lot of pressure, I think that he also examines, like cross-examines his opponents and like kind of determines which final Jeopardy categories they would be strong in and which ones they wouldn't be strong in. With that ability, he's been able to back himself into a lot of wins with some savvy wagering, which I think will be something that a lot of the toughest players in the tournament may need to look towards if they end up facing him in the quarterfinals because he could definitely sneak a win walk express style so you think that his wagering strategy is more so of an advantage than what i described as not necessarily a disadvantage but possibly something that could for lack of a better term, put him in jeopardy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <Hate myself>. Living <laughs> in jeopardy. <laughs> Well, yeah, I, I think it's something that's been a lot more beneficial to him, for sure. Okay. And um, I don't know how that will help him in the Tournament of Champions, but I guess we'll see. Do you have any comments about Brian or Tyler that you haven't talked about? So I think that one of Brian's biggest strengths is I find his style of play to be pretty versatile. Because there are some games where he will 
be a lot more conservative with his betting, but there are also games where he'll just go all in when he needs it the most. I think it was his sixth game. He actually had the lowest Coriat of his three players, uh, two players, sorry. He wagered everything on a 9,600 daily double, got it right, and his opponent wagered 8,000, got it wrong. Would have been ahead otherwise before Final Jeopardy. But I think the fact that he's played against players who are that good while still posting the stats that he did, as well as against Zach, uh, really puts him in more elite territory with like Ryan and the others. So below B+, plus, we have the flat B level competitors who had an adjusted points total between 4.8 and 7.1, which includes Zach Newkirk, 6.5, and Christine Welchel, 6.3. To avoid, or rather to limit the confusion for the rest of this segment, I'll be referring to Zach Newkirk by his last name. Yay! Between... <laughs> take, take that! Take that <laughs> okay, Zach. well, there we go. Between the two of them, Newkirk has the higher average Coriot score, percentage of games won in locks, and daily double get rate, while Christine has the higher final jeopardy get rate, buzz percentage, and correct response rate. Like John, I didn't watch Newkirk's run when it aired, but I do know he was brought back in the middle of Brian's run. Interestingly, Christine ranks second in second overall, rather, in Final Jeopardy get rate, but also 19th in Daily Double get rate. And out of the five four-game champions in the TOC, I have her ranked third. Not much else to say other than compared to the rest of the field, Newkirk and Christine had average Coriot scores that were at the lower end of the spectrum, about 15,900 for Newkirk and 15,300 for Christine. Zach and Bliss, where did you place Newkirk relative to Brian and Christine relative to the other four game champions in your power rankings? So so just to just to address what you just brought up, uh after my game aired, there was somebody who was like on Twitter and a bunch of my friends jumped on this immediately. Uh, was like, oh, is Zach from Jeopardy single? He seems nice. And a bunch of people responded right away with, no, Zach Newkirk is happily married. What are you doing? You know? <laughs> so, and then he was, then I think he jumped in like, no, 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 not me, not me, not me. Um, Cause we're also both from the DC area as, as I brought up Wasco. Yeah. Do you guys uh, n- happen to know when Zach Newkirk's fourth win was taped? Uh, I can go to G-Archive. Right? No, March I have 11. it up. I have it up. Oh, yes. March 11th, 2020, oh, <laughs> which was over 500 yeah. years ago. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, to, I, I, I've, I've mentioned this before, but really putting my finger on it. Zach Newkirk has had all the time in the world to get ready for this moment. I agree that his, you know, his play style or whatever, nothing especially remarkable. I somehow cannot. Oh, I'm realizing I only I I missed him because he was season 36. He's not on. I don't have the numbers handy for him, but he beat Brian Chang, you know, plus one to him in that. So I would actually probably put them in the same place. Other than that, not much to say about Zach Newkirk. Christine, again, this is me speaking. I'm team everyone. She had a good run. Seemed like a lovely human being. Any of these people, I would be have a route to the finals as i mentioned because the structure kind of allows for somebody to win two games and make it to the finals all these people have won two games of jeopardy but um i would be i'm going to really underline this not upset not disappointed i would be surprised if they made it to the final okay that's fair how about you bliss where would you rank zach uh in relation to brian and christine relative to the other four game champions Yeah, I don't know. Like, have y'all seen his game against Brian? Because it's pretty convincing that he's, I think that he's better than that suggests, you know? I I definitely did watch that. I I remember watching that in the episode where Zach Newkirk came back and was reintroduced as like the returning champion, et cetera, et cetera. I'd have to check J-Archive to be sure, but I'm pretty sure it was like a pretty convincing win over Brian. Yeah, it was very convincing. And fun facts, uh, Newkirk's the only player to play under Alex Trebek in this tournament. Oh, wow. So I think the fact that he can come back from not only the host no longer being there, as well as being able to face a TOC player like Brian and win so convincingly, suggests that the long breaks don't deter his gameplay too much. Mm. I think that will help him a little bit. And that's also why I put him in the eights here. And 
uh, you asked about someone else, right, Jarek? Yeah, Christine, relative to, you know, John, Jackie, Margaret, and Maureen. Yeah. So I actually have Christine in the seat here, which is still passing <laughs> and not deterring their ability, obviously. Like, all of these players are still probably in, like, the 99th percentile of Jeopardy players. Of course, yeah. But, um... When it, when it comes to just, like, relative to the field, I have Margaret ranked ahead of Christine. Okay. Um, I do think that her stats or how many games she could have won uh, is a little bit better than it suggests. Because I do think that she could outplay Maureen most of the time. In Maureen's second to fifth games, Margaret probably could have picked up a lot more money than she did because um i believe that near the end of her run she was starting to demonstrate an ability to loosen up more and just wager as much as possible which i think will be very beneficial to her in a tournament setting for the same reason i think it'll benefit players like andrew and eric but that's just what i think so to finally round out the b tier and my power rankings is the b minus level competitors who had an adjusted points total less than 4.8 so you know the very low end of the spectrum that includes margaret shelton at exactly 4.8 courtney shaw at 4.5 megan Waxpress 3.6 and marino neal 3.3 of this group margaret has the highest average choreot score percentage of games won in locks and buzz percentage courtney has the highest final jeopardy get rate and correct response rate and Maureen has the highest daily double get rate. I didn't watch Courtney's run when it aired, mainly because at the time, I took a break from watching the show when there was a revolving door of hosts. Courtney ranks third overall in Final Jeopardy get rate and 18th in buzz percentage and daily double get rate. Megan ranks 18th overall in average choreot score and percentage of games won in locks, as well as 19th in correct response rate. Lastly, we have Maureen, who ranks 18th overall in correct response rate and 19th in average choreot score, percentage of games won in locks, and buzz percentage. Last episode, we were wondering if betting on Jeopardy contestants was a thing, and Roan thought there was, so if you manage to find a bookmaker that does this sort of thing, one, hit me up, and two, one of these competitors winning the TOC would probably give you the greatest payout. The odds aren't great, but hey, you never know. Zach and Bliss, first, if either of you have any recollection of Courtney's run, I'd love to hear what it was like. Do you think these four deserve to be grouped at the bottom of the list compared to everyone else? Or am I being too harsh by underestimating Margaret, Courtney, Megan, or Marine? So I don't think it's too harsh simply because like this is a ranking of, as I mentioned several times, very strong competitors. Like I'm not going to say specifically who should be like last or second to last or what have you, but this is a, a very strong group. It's not meant to be in any way a comment on them being anything less than very, you know, very strong trajectory players out of the general pool. I would say I, the thing is, I do agree that like out of the numbers, out of the performances, there's nothing from that quantifiable realm that we can suggest we can look at and go, oh, yeah, so they actually look out for this, look out for this, look out for this. The reality is, I mean, all of these people hopefully have been doing some amount of prep. We don't know who's been in the lab. We don't know who's changed up their play style. Like Buzzy Cohen very famously like really adjusted his prep style in the lead up to the Tournament of Champions and it paid off. I feel like it's, it's very possible that one of these people in the sort of like lowest group or other people we discussed below the top tier could have been doing that. We just uh, like don't know about it or we won't know about it until it airs. And it's like, oh, how do we never see this coming? Megan's point specifically, or to Megan specifically... I just need to shout this out because I need to shout this out. She's the one out of the group where I can go her, the way she won games is replicable in the tournament of champions, because if it's, even if she's the third, even if theoretically she's the third strongest player on the stage that day, I mean, there are definitely days in her run where she wasn't the strongest quizzer out of the three. As long as she sticks around, she's going to do the five chess moves ahead board wager that, Oh wow, she's she won by a dollar. How did that happen? I would go ahead and give free and completely unsolicited advice to anyone playing Megan to make very weird double jeopardy sorry, daily double wagers. Wager like 1309 or some nonsense like that and just challenge her to figure out the the exact game theory perfect solution to uh oh, win in finals against evil. her. 
That is, but I'm I'm evil. I I I have I have yeah. Embrace the um, chaos, Zach. Embrace just just look. <laughs> you, yeah, these are known known quantities or whatever. But yeah, like I said, the way the tournament's set up, none of these people, all of them have a route to the final. It's just two games. They've won two games. Shout out to them for making it this far. It's a very very hard thing to win Jeopardy once, let alone four or five times. How about you, Bliss? What do you think of me putting these four at the bottom of my tier list? Well, I'll kind of go to the bottom of my tier list just because we're kind of at that point. But uh, more or less agree. I swear I'm not anti-women. I'm literally (laughs) a woman. In my C tier list, I have Christine, Megan, and Maureen. Now, one thing I do want to point out about these players, though, while they may be in the lowest tier, I don't want us to forget how they started because Megan started by unseating Erica Hosick. Yes. And we've seen how Eric plays and we've seen how smart and strategic Megan can get. I think that given that there's no longer an expectation to do well enough for at least a wild card, she could be doing some serious damage by forcing her players to do well enough to where like she can't sneak a victory. Mm. And uh, when it comes to Maureen, of course, like even though she has the lowest, uh, four day score here she did outplay margaret in her losing game she did she had a higher coriat and uh the betting definitely worked in her advantage even though it wasn't a particularly good wager there are some other things about the games uh that i did note she held very narrow leads into Final Jeopardy in her second and third games, and she came from third place in her fourth game. However, she has shown the ability that she's not afraid to go big on Final Jeopardy, and her and Christine both also have a pretty good Final Jeopardy get right, and Courtney as well. I will also mention that. Mm, And I have this in my notes, but I mentioned that Courtney is like kind of proto Megan. And that she backed her way into a lot of wins from second and third place. But she was still one of the longest running champions of season 37. A season that was caught in a massive drought of long streaks. I mean, not even Mm. John won five games. He didn't even do particularly badly in his losing game. With Maureen, she's the only player in the lineup to finish in the red in her losing game which isn't really a promising performance to fall back on, but it was also the end of a tape day. I think that her ability to be as loose as possible could be a hidden strength too. I think that every single one of these players had their own unique strengths that could benefit them in this tournament. I actually asked Bliss last night when the last time the defending champion finished in the red like Marine did, like she mentioned, and while she couldn't find the last time it happened, in general, it has happened before, specifically two people who competed in previous TOCs. One example uh, I was given was Michael Bilo, who finished in the red in his fourth game, interestingly against Kerry Green, who finished as the second runner-up in the 2015 TOC, won by Alex Jacob. Another example of a champion who flamed out in the end would be Philip Two. He didn't participate in a TOC, but in 2016, he also won three games before finishing in the red in game four. I actually remember Philip because before James Holsauer in 2019, and Bliss, you can fact check me on this one, Philip actually held the record for the largest daily double bet, which was initially set by Roger Craig at 18,000 in 2011. Philip wagered 19,000 on a clue in a category titled Country and Town, and just barely managed to respond with What is Vancouver before being ruled correct. It was also the last clue called in Double Jeopardy, which locked up the game for Philip. I highly recommend you check it out if you haven't seen this episode. There's a clip of it on YouTube with just under a million views. Yeah, um, uh, 19,000 was the record at the time. Interestingly enough, there was a record from pre-doubled amounts that actually tied that record because they bet 9,500 on a true daily double but it was actually 19,000 in doubled values. Unfortunately, I can't quite recall which one it was. I think it was one of the international championships. And I think I just found it actually. Uh, It's show number 3,793. So yeah, there you have it. My tier list slash power rankings for the 2022 TOC. Hot takes include Matea being on the same level as Andrew rather than Matt and Amy. Eric possibly being the fifth best competitor on the roster, 
Sam and Jaskarin being rated above some notable syndicated champions, Ryan being placed on the B plus level next to Brian and Tyler, and Courtney and Megan, despite being seven and six game champions respectively, being placed at the very bottom of my rankings. Zach or Bliss, do you have any more hot takes that you haven't shared that you'd like to throw out there or any concluding remarks about the TOC before we basically end this episode? I've covered most of my notes. Uh, I failed to mention, I just wrote next to Jonathan Fisher's name, has that dog in him? So <laughs> I just want to... Ad- what does there that even mean? Get- there's like a, it's like a college, it's just a thing that you say about football players where it, it doesn't necessarily mean anything tangible. You just like, it's, he's a confederate, man. He's got that dog in him. So, <laughs> okay. Uh, so there's that. I mentioned stuff about prep time. Um, yeah. Other than that, um, I think all of our ratings are justifiable. Who knows what's going to happen? Like I mentioned, this is going to be a fun tournament to watch. I'm excited for it. Uh, not even talking about the the wrenches that whoever comes out of the second chance tournament is going to play. Oh yeah, we I forgot to mention this doesn't even take into account the second chance tournament yeah, winners. That's what I was going to go over. Yeah, a um, I actually made a separate yeah. ranking for that, but it's pretty much the same as the breakdown that we did in our post podium episode about the second chance tournament. So uh, I mean, I posted it on Twitter if you want to see the tier list that was made. But, you know, the usual suspects were at the top of the list. Uh, Jeff Smith, Alicia O'Hare, Pam Schoenberg, Rowan. Tom Philippos. Rowan was in there in the A tier. But, yeah. Um, other than that, it's kind of hard to tell because, you know, you're only basing the data set on one game. So I'll probably update my TOC tier list once the SET concludes. You know, like that Saturday, Sunday before the TOC begins the following Monday. So I'll probably update it with the second chance tournament winners then. Yeah, I don't have the brain power left in me to try to, like, do the Doctor Strange multiverse of, like, what if it's Rowan and Pam? What if it's Jeff and Alicia? What if it's <laughs> Cindy and Jessica? Like, what does that do? Yeah. Um, and I'd rather all... wait for the matchups to come out, too. So. Yeah, yeah. At a certain point, it's uh, it's kind of wild speculation. But, Bliss, what were you going to say? Yeah, so I did make a section, too, for second chance tournament participants. Um I'll just kind of go over the S tier and the six players that I think have the best chances of winning. I have Rowan in the S tier. They're very high reputation in the uh, trivia community. Jeff Smith, because of uh, his incredibly high Coriat score. Alicia O'Hare, same reason. Uh, Jessica Stevens, faced off against Matt and Jonathan. I feel like there's almost a little too much hype around her, but I still hesitate to put her in any tier lower than this, just on virtue of like what she did in that one game. And I also have Sarah Snyder and Pam Schoenberg in the S tier. Matea's toughest opponent in, in Sarah, and Amy's probably toughest opponent in Pam. I think Doe is also a tough opponent, but I think that Pam has the most potential for sure. Yeah, I agree that any of any of those people making the tournament of champion tournament of champions proper would automatically put them I don't know, middle of the pack easily out of this field. Like strong contention to make final. I have the coldest take possible, which is like Amy or Matt are probably going to win this thing <laughs> just because of how the finals, just because how the finals set up that it's going to favor. You know, it's it's going to limit the amount of upset potential that can happen. And again, like just to just to really put a pin on it, I would be surprised but not disappointed if somebody else got some shine out of this thing. Great. And with that, we have reached the end of today's episode. Thank you so much, Zach and Bliss, for coming onto the podcast to discuss the upcoming TOC with me. And again, thank you, Bliss, for your contributions to the Jeopardy all-time leaderboard. Before we sign off, where can people find you online? And is there anything or anyone you'd like to plug or shout out? Go right ahead. You can follow me on Twitter. I'm like always on Twitter. My handle is at living in Jeopardy without the G because I ran out of character space. And you can also find me on Jboard if you're part of that niche community for like longtime Jeopardy fans. Finish him so. C-O-E. Uh, nothing too crazy. I'm on Twitter at Zach Oslin. If you are looking at the notes of the episode, you could just Google me and there aren't that many Zach Oslins on the planet, as I mentioned. Um, I mostly post on Twitter about trivia stuff and then also professional wrestling and professional wrestling data, actually. I'm probably one of the 10 leading pro wrestling data scientists in that I can't imagine there are more than 10 people doing that nonsense. Um, and then echoing Roan's uh, call from last week to give to abortion funds i've got a recurring donation set up i had one before that happened but then i also did some additional i got a bandana 
this past week that says abortion's a human right. I stand by that. So just wanted to echo that again because I think it was a thing worth highlighting with the time that we have. Perfect. And now this is when I close out the show by asking you to please rate this podcast on whatever platform you're listening to. Post Podium is available on all sorts of listening platforms, including Amazon Music, Anchor, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Radio Public, Spotify, and Stitcher. So make sure to follow and subscribe for the latest episodes. I've been your host, Jarek Ruel. And remember, if someone asks what you're listening to, always phrase your response in the form of a question. What is Post Podium? See you next time. Mm-hmm.